Ms. Pat asked me if I would like to take part in this service today. I told him it would be one of my greatest honors to share with you just a little bit about this wonderful man whom I dearly love. Chuck has been my teacher, mentor, friend, hunting companion, and really like another father to me over the past 40 years. I told Ms. Pat the hardest thing about me doing this today was going to be keeping my comments to under an hour. And, uh, <laughs> it reminded me of a story Chuck told me one time. He was asked to, uh, to preach a sermon in a church, and the entire congregation was, it was people of color. And he said he was a little nervous about preaching to a crowd this week because it was a big church. And he said he got up there and got behind the pulpit and he started preaching. And he said those people began to encourage him with amens and hallelujahs. And Chuck said, I really got into it. And then they, they began to even encourage him more diligently with more amens and hallelujahs. And he said, the next thing I knew, I've been preaching them for over an hour. And so I guess the best advice that I can give you folks while I'm up here today is nobody say amen. <laughs> My association with Chuck and Miss Pat began in 1987, just like Scott. I was a freshman at Arkansas State University. One of the very first classes I had was Dr. Charles Joyner's sociology class. I'll never forget the first day we were in that class. One of the students asked Chuck, he said, what shall we call you? And he said, Oh, your highness would be just fine. <laughs> Through those years, I would see Chuck out around town at Walmart or Lowe's somewhere. He'd always tell me, he said, now when my dentist retires down in Cersei, I'm going to come see you and be your patient. And lo and behold, one day, his name was on my appointment schedule, and he came in to see me. And he was talking to me about the land that he owned in Sharp County. He knew that I liked to hunt, and he said, you ought to come hunt with me sometime. And I said, well, I'd love to do that. And uh, he said, you know, there's... 50 acres for sale right beside my land, and you might just be interested in buying that. And to make a long story short, I wound up buying 200 acres that joined what Chuck and Miss Pat owned. And so we had 350 acres right there that we actually managed together. It became what we call the Jane H. Hunting Club for Joiner and Higgins. And for decades, we, we worked that land together to uh, manage it for hunting. And so that, that's where that all began in all those years of working together. And Chuck and I, for years, ran chainsaws, tractors, bulldozers, cedars, spray rigs. We sawed down a bunch of trees to create trails, roads, food plots, wildlife openings. And we planted an entire valley between two mountains. And in the springtime, it looked like the green fields of Ireland down through there. And so I say all that just so you'll understand I've spent a lot of time with Chuck Joyner. And I got to thinking about what he meant to me and to everyone else. And, and I asked myself the question, just who was Chuck Joyner? And we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but he was a real man's man. He restored MG cars, as has been mentioned, rode motorcycles, played guitar, sang. He built and competitively shot muzzleloaders. He loved to hunt anything from a dove to a quail. It didn't matter what it was. He loved to be outdoors and loved hunting. He was a certified mountain man. Some of those pictures that you saw of him in buckskins, he, his name and number are in their record book. He was a certified mountain man. He was one of the most intelligent men I've ever met and the most avid reader I've ever come across in my lifetime. He was one of the most compassionate, loving, and tender-hearted people I've ever encountered. And an example of that is one fall, we were preparing all of our food plots to be planted. Chuck was going ahead of me with a tractor and a bush hog, and he was mowing down all the chest-high weeds in all those fields, and I was coming behind him, and I had a plow, and was, I was preparing all of the soil to plant all those fields. I got to the very last field, and I looked, and I thought, what is this? He had left a strip of weeds about five yards wide right down the middle of that food plot all the way through there and I thought what did he leave that there for? And I got to look and there were flowers all over those weeds and thousands of butterflies were using those flowers and so I got back to the cabin and I said Chuck why did you leave all those weeds in that back food plot? And he said didn't you see all those butterflies? They were getting nectar out of those flowers and I didn't have the heart to maw all of them. And that's the kind of heart that the man had. <clears throat> and he loved his mother. Chuck could not talk about his mother without crying. And I'm, I'm glad to know that his ashes are going to be laid to rest beside her. 
his obituary stated that he was a practicing Christian. And I thought, that's 100% correct. Because he lived out the example that God showed us in Scripture. When you look at Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. And as it was mentioned, he placed over 200 children in homes for adoption. He helped to prosper those children and give them all a hope and a future. He did that for everyone he met. For every student that sat in his classroom, he did that for me. In 1987, when I sat in his classroom as a freshman at Arkansas State University, Chuck Joyner was helping to give me a hope and a future. I've seen him do some amazing things, too. Um, somebody asked me about this picture over here of him holding that rat. I took that picture. We were cleaning up a pile of metal, old scrap metal, on our land over there, putting it on a trailer to haul away. And I heard Chuck shout, it's a rat. And I turned around and looked and I saw him pick up a rock and he threw that thing. And then the next thing I heard was, I killed that rat. And both his feet went in the air and I looked over here and I'm looking at this deceased rat and the rock that he threw laying beside it. And I remember thinking, I don't know if Bob Gibson could have done that. So that was a pretty amazing feat. And I took that picture. Somebody asked me about it. I said, I'll tell you the story. Another thing that I saw him do, and uh, this was um, just basically a, a feat of superhuman strength. When I purchased that land, Chuck was showing me around, and we were on my Kodiak four-wheeler. I had, I had this big Yamaha Kodiak four-wheel drive four-wheeler. Chuck was on the back, and we were riding all around looking at the place, and we had, there were little trails. We hadn't opened these trails up very well yet. I'd just gotten the place, and we were sort of surveying. And we got up on top of one of the I call them mountains. They're, you walk up it a couple times, you'll think it's a mountain too. You'll be out of breath when you get up there. But we, we were riding around on the four-wheeler and it got pretty steep. And uh, Chuck said, this is getting pretty steep right here going around this hill. I'm going to hop off. And as soon as he got off, he, I no more than went five yards. And it got so steep to the side that that four-wheeler started to roll downhill. And I, I saw it was going to roll over. And so I leaped to try to get off the thing, but I landed downhill of the four-wheeler and it started to roll side over side and it was coming at me and I was backpedaling trying to get away from it. Well, I tripped and fell and the, the thing came to rest. It pinned me against a tree and it didn't, I wasn't hurt, but the seat of the four-wheeler had me pressed against that tree and I could not move. And I looked and here came Chuck running and I said, uh, Chuck, can you give me a hand? And he reached down and grabbed the front rack of that four-wheeler and tossed that thing off me as if it weighed no more than a loaf of bread. Now, this big Kodiak four-wheeler, under normal circumstances, would take four full-size, grown, strong men to roll over like that. I still, to this day, I saw it with my own two eyes, but it's hard to believe that he did something like that. But Chuck was human. One day I went to see him and rang the doorbell and when he came to the door, he opened up the door and his right eye was just as black, solid black as he could be. I said, Chuck, what happened? Didn't this pack you left hook? <laughs> he said, no, but I can't find the ramrod to my muzzleloader. And if you know anything about muzzleloaders, you know that when you shove the bullet down the muzzle with the ramrod, you're supposed to take the ramrod out before you fire the gun. He had been out back sighting his muzzleloader and he left the ramrod in when he fired. And a 50 caliber muzzleloader with a barrel obstruction like that is going to kick you like a mule and it wound up blacking his eye pretty good. And another time, I took him turkey hunting. You saw some of these pictures where I was hunting with him. I, we were going to that same field that I told you about where he left those weeds for the butterflies. I had fixed us up a place to hunt turkeys in the spring. And turkeys gobble early in the morning. They start gobbling before daylight. So we got out there really early. And I had us a couple of spots picked out in a pine thicket. And I had a little spot fixed up where we could be hidden. And Chuck was off to my right over here. And I told him, I said, if we get lucky and two birds come in, I'll shoot the one on the left and shoot the one on the right. Because the way we're set up was we might be lucky and kill two birds. So we sat there 20 or 30 minutes. It was getting light. We were hearing a few turkeys gobbling in a little bit. I saw two red heads come out of the woods across the food plot, and they were walking toward the decoy I had. And I thought, man, we're about to kill two turkeys. And they walked right up with those decoys. I eased my gun up, and I told them, I said, now, when they get up to the decoy, I'll you know, shoot them, and we'll shoot at the same time. 
So these turkeys walk up there and I raise my gun and I bead down the turkey on the left. I'm leaving that turkey on the right for Chuck. I flip my gun off safety and I uh, shoot him. And nothing happened. And the turkeys got really nervous. And I thought, oh boy, they're fixing to get out of here. So I shot the bird on the left. The bird on the right flew away and I turned around and I said, Chuck, what the heck just happened? And he said, I was asleep. <laughs> So he was human, just like all the rest of us. As far as Chuck's relationship with Miss Pat, that's, that's an unusual relationship. Most guys go to deer camp for two reasons. Number one, to try to shoot a deer. Number two, to get away from their wife. But Chuck Joyner was not that way. The happiest I've ever seen that man is when he was at deer camp and Miss Pat was there and had all their dogs with him. And you had a wonderful, beautiful relationship with him. And I know you know that, and I appreciate it so much. My wife has said, I wish that you loved me as much as you loved her. <laughs> I've been a little selfish about my hunting in the past, I'll admit it. <clears throat> but he sure, he sure did love you, and it's obvious how much you loved him. I've got to reiterate, I, it, it's a, a beautiful thing to see how Miss Pat took care of him in these last few days. I was asked to sing in the service, and I felt that that would be appropriate because Chuck had a beautiful baritone singing voice. Through all those years that we worked together on our honeymoon end, we sang to each other all the time. We'd be riding up and down those trails, and, and we'd sing classic country songs and old hymns and gospel songs like uh, Heaven Holds All to Me. That was Chuck's favorite. There's one song that I thought of which really describes Chuck's mindset near the end of his life. The last few times that I spoke to him, he said, Cliff, I'm just ready to go home. And I thought of this song. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand, I'm tired, I'm told Miss Pat that he was like my Kimosabi and I was his Tonto. There's a line in a Merle Haggard song that says, let him sing me back home with a song I used to hear. So if you'll indulge me, I'd like to close my part of the service by singing my friend home with the chorus from a song that I believe Chuck will approve. Now my heart is sinking like the setting sun. Setting on the things I wish I'd done. Oh, the last goodbye is the hardest one to say. This is where the cowboy rides away. Oh, the last goodbye is the hardest one to say. This is where the cowboy rides away. 